Thank you, Dr. Campbell, Dr. Zakir Naik, for your presentations as well as the response. Lastly, we have the audience participation session, namely the question and answer session. To extract maximum benefit in the limited time of 60 minutes approximately that we have available, we would like the following rules to be observed. Your question should be only on the topic, the Quran and the Bible in the light of the subject of science. Questions out of the topic would not be entertained. Kindly state your question briefly and to the point. This is not a lecture time, neither a counter question time for the questioners. Dr. William Campbell and Dr. Zakir Naik should answer comprehensively and each answer should not exceed five minutes. Four mics have been provided in the auditorium for the questions from the mics. Two next to the stage for the gents and two in the rear of the center aisles for the ladies. Those who would like to put forward a question to Dr. William Campbell may kindly queue up behind the mics on my left, gents in the front, ladies in the rear, and those who would like to put forward a question to Dr. Zakir may kindly line up behind the mics on my right, gents in the front, and the ladies in the rear. I would like the audience in the balcony to kindly excuse us. We are happy that this is a full session, jam-packed hall, but we request you to kindly take the trouble to come down to the mics if you'd like to put forward a question. Only one question at a time may be put forward. If you have a second question, you would have to line up behind again to put forward your second question. Written questions on index cards available from the volunteers in the aisles would be given secondary preference after the questions on the mics are handled by the speakers. Please write on the card to whom your question is addressed, Dr. William Campbell or Dr. Zakir Naik, so that they can be put in the appropriate boxes in front of you, transparent boxes with the names Dr. William Campbell and Dr. Zakir Naik put on them, so that the questions could be shaken up by the coordinators and the speakers themselves could select the questions at random. These would be screened by the panel of the speakers to see that they are relevant and on the topic and okayed by the coordinators to be put forward on the coordinator's mic, which the speakers would have to answer. Kindly state your name and profession before putting forward your question. We will allow one question at a time in a zigzag fashion, alternately addressed to each speaker. So first question next to the stage, second question next to the stage, third question on my left in the rear, fourth question in the rear on my right, and so on. We would allow approximately 40 minutes for these questions, then we switch over to the questions on the slips. May we have the first question from the mic on my left for Dr. William Campbell. I would like to ask Dr. Campbell if uh, in Genesis, it says when it talks about the flood, Noah flood, it talks about that the water covered the surface of the earth, all the creations and all the mountains and everything. And it says that it covers the highest mountain of, on earth. And that was 15 cubits, which is in Arabic 15 foot, you know, qadam. So we know scientifically that the highest mountain on earth is not 15 foot, you know. It is a lot higher than that. So how come the, in Genesis, it says that the water covered everything, every single mountain on earth, and the highest was 15 feet. Thank you for your question. I think it's saying that that is above the highest mountain. If the highest mountain is 3,000 meters, well, then, the high, then it's 15 feet over 15 foot above it. However, uh, brother, we'll not allow any questions in between. No counter questions, please. Let the questioner put his question, full stop. 
Then the speaker yes. gives his answer in whatever manner he chooses. Thank you. And I looked into this uh, in the Cor in the Quran. I think it actually would be understood to be the same way because it says in Surah 11, verse 40, the fountains of the earth gushed forth, and the waves like mountains. And then it says that in uh, in in the places where it gives a list of prophets, there's no prophet before Noah. It, and so it, I know Adam can be a prophet, but I'm so Noah is, is listed. And I think that it says in the Quran too that the whole world was covered. Yes, brother. The question for Dr. Zakir Naik. Dr. Zakir, you say that there isn't uh, any excuse, mistake. Excuse in me, Quran. excuse me. The second question would come from the mic on my right for Dr. Zakir. Okay, um, you said that Allah reflects light and um, He's made a nur. I didn't really understand that. The brother posed the question. He didn't understand my explanation to the counter argument of Dr. William Campbell regarding nur and Allah. The Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter 24, verse number 35, that Allah is Nur Samawati wal Ard, is the light of the heavens and the earth. He's a light. The meaning of light in the Quran, it is reflected light, a borrowed light. So he's asking, does it mean that even Allah has got borrowed light? So the answer is giving further if you read in the verse, it says that it's like a parable of a niche. In the niche, there is a lamp. Lamp has a light of its own. That means Allah has light of its own, as well as that light of its own is also being reflected. The light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is again being reflected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. Like a halogen lamp that you see here, it has a tube in between. The lamp, you can refer to that as a siraj or a wahaj or a diya. And the reflector as munir or nur, borrowed light or reflection of light. And furthermore, but natural, this light actually doesn't refer to the physical light you're talking about. It is the spiritual light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as an answer I've given to Dr. William Campbell, and since I've got five minutes, I would like to utilize it. Dr. William Campbell gave a reply to Nuh alayhi salam. I'm a person who is a concordist approach with the Bible and conflict approach with the Quran, because both ways, alhamdulillah, Quran will pass the test. And even if I agree with Dr. William Campbell, and I agree with him, it is right, that it was 15 feet above the highest mountain. But it's mentioned in Genesis, chapter number 7, verse number 19 and 20, that the full world was submerged underwater. And furthermore, archaeological evidence shows today, and the time of Noah's time, if you calculate by genealogy, it comes to in the 21st to 22nd century BC. Archaeological evidence shows today that the third dynasty of Babylon and 11th dynasty of Egypt were present at the 21st and 22nd century BC, and there was no evidence of flood and they remain uninterrupted. Therefore, archaeological evidence shows us that it's impossible that the earth was submerged, the full earth was submerged underwater in the 21st, 22nd century BC. What about the Quran? What about the Quran? Point number one, Quran does not give a date. But the 21st century BC or 50th century BC, no date. Point number two, nowhere does the Quran say the full world was submerged underwater. It speaks about Noah alayhi salam and his calm and his people. A small group of people, or maybe a large group of people, archaeological evidences tell today, and the archaeologists they say that we have no objection. It's possible that parts of the world were submerged underwater, but full world, it's not possible. So, Alhamdulillah, the Quran is matching with the latest discovery in archaeology, but the Bible does not. Furthermore, if you read Genesis chapter number six, verse number 15, 16, it speaks about Almighty God telling Noah alayhi salam that build an ark and it gives the length, 300 cubit in length, 50 cubit in breadth, and height 30 cubit. Cubit is one and a half feet. The brother made a mistake. It's one and a half feet. And in the New International Version, it says 450 feet in length, and 75 feet in breadth, and approximately 45 feet in height. It's 30 cubit in height. If you measure this, I've done the calculation, it comes to less than 150,000 cubit feet in volume. And area-wise, 33,750. And the Bible says there were three flows. Ground floor, first story, second story. So multiply by three, you get an answer of 101,250 square feet. 
That is the area. Imagine a pair of all the species of the world was accommodated in 101,250 square feet. Imagine. Is it possible? Millions of species are there in the world. If I tell in this auditorium, one million people came in this auditorium. Will you believe? I remember, I think last year, I'd given a talk in Kerala, and there were one million people. That's the biggest gathering I've addressed, alhamdulillah, by Allah's grace. One million people, I could not see the end. It was not an auditorium, it was a big beach. I couldn't see anyone. Only few people in the front, that's all. Few compared to the one million people that were there. If you see on the video, you'll realize how big is one million. Somewhat like Arafat, you see two and a half million people in Arafat. In an area of 101,250 square feet, or 150,000 cubic feet, it is impossible. And above that, they stayed for 40 days, eating, going for call of nature. If I say one million people came in this auditorium, will you believe? So scientifically, there are several things in which there are gross scientific errors in the Bible. Can we have the next question for Dr. Campbell from the mic at the rear? Dr. Naik, you said no, no, that there me. is... This question is for Dr. Campbell. Okay. So you have so to wait. So the next person who would like to ask a question to doc for Dr. Campbell. Yes. I'd like to pose this question, or rather uh, this test, to Dr. William Campbell. Why don't you attempt the falsification test of the Bible given in the book of Mark, chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, and prove to the audience here, right now, that you are a true Christian believer. Well, I don't agree with Dr. Nike's interpretation. God's, Jesus himself was tempted. And the devil said, well, if you're the son of God, throw yourself off the temple. And Jesus said, you will not tempt the Lord your God. And so if I was to stay and say, oh, yes, I'm going to be sure and do a miracle in front of you, I would be tempting God. My friend, Harry Radcliffe, he had promised to go. And so he decided to keep his promise and trust God to do his will. It's a different situation. I will not tempt God. Okay, thank you. Question for Dr. May Nike. Maybe we have the question in the rear. From the sister? She's, a, she's for Dr. Nike. Oh, at, the, Campbell. at the back. Do you have a question for Dr. Nike in the yes. back, ladies? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Um, my question is to Dr. Zachary Nike. The Christians explain the Who concept of tr Dr. Trinity scientifically by giving the example of water, which can be in three states solid, liquid, and gas in the form of ice, water, and vapor. Similarly, one God is a tri triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Is this explanation scientifically correct? Just a comment before I give the answer. We should not tempt God. We should not test God. But here we aren't testing God. We are testing the human being. We should not test God. But here we are testing you. And God promises that any believer who has deadly poison, he will not die. He'll be able to speak in foreign tongues. We aren't testing God. We know God is correct. He will see to it that every believer can speak. We are testing you whether you're a believer or not. Coming to the question of the sister that there are Christians who say that scientifically we can prove the concept of Trinity, like how water can be in three states, solid, liquid, and gas, like ice, water, and vapor. So similarly, God is in three forms, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. How to reply, and is this scientifically correct? Scientifically, I do agree, water can be in three forms, solid, liquid, and gas, ice, water, and vapor. But Scientifically, we also know that the component of water remains the same, H2O, two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. The components remain the same, the constituent remains the same, the forms keep on changing, there is no problem. Let's check with the concept of Trinity. Concept of Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Form, they say form changes. Okay, for sake of argument, we agree. Does the component change? God and Holy Ghost is made of spirit. Human beings are made of flesh and bones. They aren't the same. Human beings require to eat. God doesn't require to eat to survive. They aren't the same. And this is testified by Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, verse number 
36 to 39. He says that, behold my hands and feet, handle me and see, for a spirit has no flesh and bones. He says, behold my hands and feet, handle me and see, for a spirit has no flesh and bone. And he gave his hand and they saw, and they were overjoyed. And he said that, do you have any meat to eat? And they gave him broiled fish and a piece of honeycomb. And he ate to prove what? That he was God? To prove that he was not God. He ate. And he flesh and bones. A spirit has got no flesh and bone. This proves that it is scientifically not possible that Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Father, J.S. Christ, peace be Holy Ghost, is Almighty God. And the concept of Trinity, the word Trinity, doesn't exist anywhere in the Bible. The word Trinity is not there in the Bible, but it is there in the Quran. Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 171, it says, Wala taqulu salasa, don't say Trinity. Intaw khair lakum, this has stopped it, it's better for you. Trinity is also there in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 73, which says, Lakat kafr ladina kalu, inna Allahu salisu salasa. They are doing kufr, they are blaspheming. Those who say that Allah is three in one, is a triune God. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, never said he was God. The concept of Trinity doesn't exist in the Bible. The only verse which is closest to the concept of Trinity is the first epistle of John, chapter number five, verse number seven, which says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. But if you read the Revised Standard Version, revised by Thaidu scholars, Christian scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 different corporate denominations, they say this verse of the Bible, first epistle, of John chapter 5 verse number 7 is an interpolation, is a concoction, is a fabrication. It was thrown out of the Bible. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, never claimed divinity. There is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, I am God, or where he says, worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, it is mentioned in the Gospel of John chapter number 14, verse number 28, he said, my father is greater than I. Gospel of John chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devils with the Spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I with the finger of God cast out devil. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says not my will, but God's will, he's a Muslim. Muslim means a person who submits his will to Almighty God. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, not my will, but God's will. He was a Muslim, and he was, alhamdulillah, one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe. We believe that he was born miraculously, without any male intervention. We believe he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. We respect Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, as one of the mightiest messengers of God, but he is not God, and he is not a part of the Trinity. Trinity doesn't exist. Quran says, Kul huallahu ahad, say he's Allah one and only. Uh, before we have the next question from the mic here, earlier I had announced that the ladies should kindly queue up there. Unfortunately, they have not queued up there, so we are having a problem of balancing the questions. Okay. What we do, we disregard the labels on the mic. Yes. If the ladies want to ask from here, we'll allow them. Just balance this in practical necessity. The hall is jam-packed, we understand. We will allow now one question yeah, for Dr. Campbell from here. And the rare mic will be for people who'd like to ask questions from the gents for Dr. Zakir. Yeah. Similarly, for the ladies, the front mic would be for Dr. William Campbell. And the rare mic would be for Dr. Zakir. Are the people queued there for Dr. Zakir? Yeah. Yes. Okay. People queued here for Dr. Let Campbell? Right. I think they have taken their own positions and changed the positions the organizers had given. We respect it because of the rush in the hall. With the next question for Dr. Campbell, Campbell from this mic. Thank you. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Um, alhamdulillah, tonight's been praise be to Allah, praise be to the one God of all mankind. Tonight's been a very interesting dialogue, um, and a dialogue at that. Um, it's talking about uh, a very noble uh, topic for mankind, for all of mankind. 
And uh, so we have gathered here as men uh, of humanity. Question, question, please. Okay. No, no statements. Okay. Question. Bismillah. Question. In the name of Allah, the question, question. is this. Okay, we've come here together for this event tonight. It should benefit us. And, and so I'm asking Dr. Campbell, uh, as a Christian and, and, and with your colleagues as well, has this event uh, done its job? Has it opened your heart? Has it, has it at least uh, opened a glimmer towards looking further into the truth of Islam? Thank you. Well, I think I'll use the last question to answer yours. Dr. Nike says there's no place that Jesus says he's God. In Mark 1461, he didn't answer. And again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? In other words, are you the Christ, the Son of God? And Jesus said, I am. So he did say, I'm the Son of God. And he did say he's divine. And it, the, the, the Bible clearly says, I realize he's quoted the verses he wished to quote, Dr. M Dr. Zeich wished to quote, where Jesus was in his human form. But there's other verses. He says, I and the Father are one. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and, the, and, the, and God was made flesh and dwelt among us. In Jesus' baptism, the Father spoke and said, this is my beloved Son. Jesus was there, and the Holy Spirit descended. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We didn't make this thing up from our heads. Just lift this little, little uh, thing. The, uh, now my the, the friend asked the question here. We've learned many things, and I'm always willing to learn, but I still think that the 500 witnesses that saw Jesus after he rose from the dead have more power with me than Mohammed coming 600 years later as one witness. Thank you. We'll allow a question Sorry. for Dr. Zakir Sorry. from the rear. Yes, sister. Um, Dr. Campbell did first attempt to bring up supposed false facts. Uh, pertaining to the Quranic views on the universe, and you did refute these accusations. However, it was not addressed what the Bible says about the shape of the earth and its other aspects. This is the question that I did not address regarding what the Bible says about the shape of the earth. Lack of time, I can point out another 100 points, lack of time. Anyhow, the system wants to know what does the Bible speak about the shape of the earth. It's mentioned in the Bible, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 4, verse number 8. It says, the same reference which Dr. William Campbell used about tempting, the devil took him, that Jesus Christ peace be upon him, to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the earth and its glory. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 4, verse number 5. The devil took him to a high mountain and showed him the glory of all the kingdoms of the world. Now, even if you go to the tallest mountain, the highest mountain in the world, that's Mount Everest, and supposedly you have a very good vision and can see for thousands of miles together, yet you will not be able to see all the kingdoms of the world because today we know the earth is spherical. You will not be able to see the kingdom of the opposite side of the world. The only way we will to see if the earth was flat. That's the description, what the Bible gives. The earth is flat. Furthermore, the same description is repeated in the book of Daniel, chapter number 4, verse number 10 and 11. It says in the dream that the tree grew up into the heaven. And there when the tree grew up into the heaven, it grew up so much that everyone from all the ends of the earth, they could see the tree. This is only possible if the shape of the earth was flat. If a tree is very long, and the shape of the earth was flat, it's possible. Today, it's a universal fact that the world is spherical. You will never be able to see the tree, however much long it is, from the opposite side of the spherical shape of the earth. Furthermore, if you read, it's mentioned in the first Chronicles, chapter number 16, verse number 30, that the earth does not move. The same is repeated in the book of Psalms, chapter number 93, verse number 1, that Almighty God, He has stabilized the earth. That means the earth does not move. And in the New International Version, it says that God has established 
and stop the movement of the earth as though one minute the earth is one minute left or one minute one minute left <laughs> i thought you asked me to wait for one minute no. regarding dr william campbell he said that jesus christ peace be upon him in the bible in several places that he was god you can refer to my video i said concept of god in major religion which gives all the references and the answers i'll only give you the references of what he quoted and my father of one is from john chapter number 10 verse number 30 and in the beginning was the word is from john chapter number 1 verse number 1 you go to the context and you'll come to know jesus christ peace be upon never claim divinity you can take my cassette which is available in the fire outside concept of god in major religion and similarities between islam and christianity which give the details that jesus christ peace be upon never claim divinity time thank you the next question from dr. the Campbell. lady in the front for dr william um you mm. mentioned the the test where a true believer can drink poison and survive because of their faith what about uh rasputin who was poisoned with enough cyanide to kill 16 people and when that didn't kill him he died of blood loss he was not a good christian he had orgies <laughs> how do you explain this where only a good christian can drink this poison and live how do you explain that well i don't feel i have to explain it i mean if rasputin wasn't a christian why what happened to him has no basis for what happened in the bible i said before Jesus God God didn't intend for us to line up here and start start taking poison and see whether he's the true God. Oh sorry. It we are not to test test God. That was given that these God that said that these things will happen. It, an example would be Paul he went to uh when he was in shipwreck and he I think it's Crete but I have the wrong place in my mind and uh and he landed And so he was throwing wood in the fire and a snake bit him. Nothing happened to him. But he wasn't trying to test God, he was trying to throw wood in the fire. It's a different situation. No comment please. Thank you. The next question okay. from the rare for Dr. Excuse, Zakir. Excuse me. Yes, brother. Excuse me, sir. Sorry, sorry, carry on. I just like to say about the circle of the earth. In Isaiah 40:22, it says he God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. Thank you. In the back for Dr. Yes, Mike. brother. For Dr. Zakir. Dr. Zakir, you said there isn't any mistake in Quran. I see more than 20 mistake in Arabic grammar, and I will tell you some of them. Inna al-ladina amanu wal-ladina hadu wasabiun. He said in Baqarah and Hal Hajj. إن الذين آمنوا والذين هادوا والصابئين which is right الصابئون or الصابئين number one number two brother he one, said one, brother one question one at question. a time yeah please. but at the same thing he said in surah taha 63 إن هذين لا ساحران mistake إن هذين لا ساحران can you explain that and there is more than that no, 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 uh, mistake brother brother will allow you only the one. first part of the question the second part will not allow because we have stated will allow okay. one question at a time so others get a chance to okay the brother has asked a very good question i would like to be more concordant and agreeing he has mentioned all 20 grammatical points and the book is referring to abdul fadi abdul fadi correct is the quran infallible i can yeah. see something yeah alhamdulillah my side is good <laughs> I will answer all 20 together because I've read the book I'll answer all 20 inshallah inshallah point number 1 brother point number 1 point number 1 to be noted that all arabic grammar is taken from the quran quran was the highest arabic book a book which has the maximum level of highest literature all the arabic grammar has been derived from the quran quran is the textbook of grammar since quran is the textbook of grammar and all the grammar is derived from the quran the quran can never have a mistake point number 1 <laughs> point number 2 point number 2 point number 2 it is like you know taking a ruler and the ruler is there has a measurement and you are saying the measurement is wrong 
it sounds illogical. Point number two, in the different tribes of Arabia, and you know Arabic, and Dr. William Campbell also will agree with me, in different Arabic tribes, the grammar keeps on changing. In some Arabic tribe, the word is feminine, the same word is even masculine in the other tribes of Arabia. In different tribes, the grammar keeps on changing. Even the gender keeps on changing. So will you check Quran with that faulty grammar? No. And furthermore, the eloquence of Quran is so high. It's so high, it is far superior. And you know there are various books on the internet you go. 12 grammatical mistake, 21 grammatical mistake, Abdul Fadi, 20 grammatical mistake. Do you think the Christian people took out these mistakes? Who took out these mistakes? Do you know who took out? The Muslims. The Muslim scholars, like Zamakshari, what they did, that the Quran grammar is so high that it goes against the conventional use of the Arabic. The Quran grammar is so high, to prove the Quranic grammar was high, they gave examples. And I'll give you a couple of examples, which will answer all these 20 questions. They give the example, like read in the Quran, it says that the people of Lut, salam, they rejected all the messengers. They rejected the messengers it's mentioned. Dr. William Campbell said, the people of Noah, they rejected the messengers. We know from history that there was only one messenger sent to them. So it has a grammatical mistake. Quran should have said, the people rejected the messenger, not messengers. I agree with you. With layman grammar like how you and I know, it may be a mistake. But if you read the books written by Arabs, what is the beauty of the Quran? The beauty of the Quran is, why does the Quran refer messengers instead of messenger? You know why? Because we know that the basic message of all the messengers was same. That there is one God. About Tawheed, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By mentioning the people of Ruth alayhi salam, the people of Noah rejected the messenger. It says by rejecting Ruth alayhi salam, they are indirectly rejecting all the messengers. See the beauty, see the eloquence, alhamdulillah. You may think it's a mistake. It's not a mistake. Similarly, people like Anush Suraj says that Quran says, kun fayakun, be and it is. It should be kun fakana, be and it was. Agreed, past tense says kun fakana in Arabic. It's not kun fayakun, but the kun fayakun is more superior. It says Allah, it was, it is, and can do. Past, present, and future. Thank you, Dr. Naik. Uh, may we have the next question from the brother in the front for Dr. William Campbell. Yes, Dr. Campbell, this is a very sincere question to learn a little more about Christianity. Uh, I want to ask that Jesus' ministry was only for three years after he was baptized by John the Baptist. So Jesus, the second most powerful person after God, the son of God, what are his contribution in his early life from first, from one year to say 27 or 28 years? What are his significant contributions? This is, uh, excuse me, uh, Dr. Campbell, uh, this, this, this is not, this is not uh, the topic for tonight. We have, we had, yeah, we, you can go ahead. Uh, in the beginning of the, his presentation, Dr. Campbell mentioned uh, Zulkarnain from the chapter 18 of uh, Quran, the cave, uh, and he mentioned that Zulkarnain is Alexander the Great. Can you prove me how you came to that that Zulkarnain is Alexander the Great? I only read it in the commentary of uh, Yusuf Ali. I w but regardless of whether it's Alexander the Great or who it is, the, mo the sun doesn't sit, doesn't set in a murky mar mar marsh. And that's what it, the verse says. <clears throat> okay, yeah, thank you. Yes, sister, the question for Dr. Zakir. I don't know the exact verse, but when the Bible says, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so shall the Son of Man be for three days and three nights the heart of the earth. Did Jesus, peace be upon him, scientifically fulfill the sign of Jonah? What the sisters are referring to is the verse of the Bible, Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 30 and 40. When people ask Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, show me a sign, show me a miracle. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, you evil and adulterous generation, seeking after a sign, no sign shall be given to you but the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Sign of Jonah. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, puts all his eggs in one basket. 
And if you go to the sign of Jonah, the book of Jonah is less than two pages, and most of us know. And if you analyze that Jonah was three days and three nights, but Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, we know from the Gospels that he was put on the cross, the alleged crucifixion, alleged. By late evening, he was brought down from the cross and put in the sepulchre. And on Sunday morning, if you see, the stone is moved away and the sepulchre is completely empty. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is in the tomb on Friday night. Friday night, he was in the tomb. Friday night. He was there in Saturday morning, one day, one night, one day. And he was there Saturday night. So two night and one day. Two night and Sunday morning, the tomb was empty. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was there for two nights and one day. It's not three days and three nights. Dr. William Campbell gives the reply in his book that, you know, part of the day can be counted as one day. And if a patient comes to me who's sick on Saturday night, on Monday morning, and if I ask him, how long are you sick for, he will say three days. I agree with you. Concordance approach, I agree. I'm very generous. You say part of the day is full day, I agree with you. So Saturday night, part of the day, one day. Sunday, part of the day, full day, one good. Monday, part of the day, full day, no problem. If patient says three days, no objection. But no patient will ever say three days and three nights. I challenge. I have, alhamdulillah, met various patients. I have not come across a single patient, including Christian missionaries, who have ever told to me who were sick in the night, day before yesterday, saying, I'm sick for three days, three nights. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon say three days. Jesus Christ, peace be upon me, says three days and three nights. So it is a mathematical error. Scientifically, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, didn't prove. And furthermore, the prophecy says, as Jonah was, so shall the son of man be. Jonah was how? How was Jonah in the belly of the whale, belly of the fish? Dead or alive? Alive. alive. When he was thrown overboard, he was alive. In the belly of the whale, he goes around the ocean. Dead or alive? Alive. He prays to Almighty God. Dead or alive? Alive. He's vomited out on the seashore. Dead or alive? Alive, 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 alive. When I asked the Christians, how was Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, in the sepulchre, in the tomb, dead or alive? They tell me dead. Alive. Alhamdulillah. Is it a Christian? If he's alive, Alhamdulillah, he was not crucified. If he's dead, he hasn't fulfilled the sign. You can refer to my video cassette, was Jesus Christ, peace be upon, really crucified? It proved that Jesus Christ, peace be upon, was not crucified. As the Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, 157, They didn't kill him, neither did they crucify him. It was only made to appear so. Thank you, Dr. Naik. Doctor, for, question for Dr. William. Dr. Campbell, since you are a medical doctor, could you please explain scientifically the various medical aspects that in the Bible regarding, because you didn't answer them in your rebuttal. For example, blood used as a disinfectant, bitter water test for adultery, and most importantly, that the woman is unclean for double the period when she gives birth to a daughter, then as compared to a son. <laughs> Thank you for the question, and I'll get to it. But Dr. Knight keeps getting the questions that should be come to the, to the Christian. <laughs> it says that on the next day, when it was one after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days, I'm to rise again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. So they're using these words interchangeably. As far as I'm concerned, all of these words, the third day, after the third day, equal what happened with Jesus in the grave. The other thing is, and then there's re resurrection. There is one other thing. When Jesus was arrested on Thursday night, Please be quiet. This is not going to work like this. Please be patient. Thursday, and when, and Thursday after he, when he was arrested, he said, my, time, my hour has come. And so I count that that's three, and, three days and three nights. Now you've asked me about these places in the Bible. I believe the Bible was written by God, and I believe that God put them in there. So I, it's not up to me to explain what God said, but I believe that God put those things in his Bible. Yes. And now we will have the last question on the mic. 
from the brothers at the back for Dr. Zakir. Then we start the questions on index cards. cards. That's the last, last question. question. As per our time limitations, please. Okay. For Dr. Um, Zakir. Assalamu alaikum. Um, my name is Aslam Rauf, and I'm a student studying uh, biology right now. And my teacher is teaching me evolution now. And I was wondering about the Islamic answer to evolution right now. If you could explain uh, briefly um, what Islam says on the topic of evolution and creationism. The brother asked a question. Just since Victor William Campbell is taking the liberty to answer, even I'll take the liberty. Nowhere in the Quran is the name of Alexander mentioned. It says Dulkarnain, not Alexander. If some commentator made a mistake, it's a mistake in the commentary. The men have made the mistake, not the word of God. Regarding the Bible saying that the world in Isaiah is a circle, no problem. It says circle, not spherical. So one place Bible says flat, one place it says circle. If you agree with both the verses, it becomes like a disc. <laughs> See? Does it look like the earth? It is circle and it is flat. This is not the earth. <laughs> regarding biology in the Quran and regarding evolution, two questions the brother asked. I don't know whether I can answer both or not. I don't this mind. One. one, which one? First one or second one? Biology or evolution? Evolution will be good. Evolution will Are be good. Are you choosing or he's choosing? <laughs> <laughs> because he had the question for evolution, I think it'll be good. Two questions, biology first, then evolution. If you give me 10 minutes, I'll answer both. No, no. Only in five minutes, whatever you can do. <laughs> okay, fine. I agree with the chairperson, Mr. Samuel Noman. I'll answer on evolution. The exact answer you can refer to my video cassette, Quran and Modern Science. Regarding when you talk about evolution, you start thinking about Darwin's theory. And Darwin went on a ship, HMS Bugle, to an island by the name of Calatropis, and he saw birds pecking at niches. Based on that observation that the beaks of the birds became long and short, he propounded the natural selection. But he wrote a letter to his friend, Thomas Thompson, in 19th century. He said that I do not have proof to propound my natural selection, but because it helps me in classification of embryology, of rudimentary organs, I have put forth this. Darwin's theory is not a fact at all. It is only a theory. And I made it very clear in the beginning of my talk, Quran can go against theories. Because theories take you turns, but Quran will not go against any established fact. And in our school, we are taught about Darwin's theory as though it's a fact. It's not a fact. There is no scientific proof at all. There are missing links. Therefore, if someone has to insult his friend, his colleague, he will say, if you were present at Darwin's time, Darwin's theory would have been proved right, insinuating he looks like an ape. <laughs> there are missing links to Darwin's theory. And I know about the four fossils that are present, the hominoids, the Lucy, Australopithecus, with its guide, the Homo erectus, Neanderthal man, Cro-Magnon. For details, refer to my video cassette. By molecular biology, according to Hanses Craig, he said it is impossible that we can be evolved from apes by DNA coding. It's impossible. You can refer to my video cassette. It gives the detail. Some parts, I've got no objection regarding biology. Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 30, that we have created every living thing from water. Will you not then believe? Today we know that every living creature, the basic substance, the cell, contains cytoplasm, which has about 90% water. Every living creature in the world has approximately 50 to 90% water. Imagine, in the deserts of Arabia, who could have imagined that everything is made of water? Quran says that 14 years ago. Time in the field, like. Thank Please. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now start the questions on slips of uh, paper. We would have this box for Dr. William Campbell, this box for Dr. Zakir Naik. We turn the boxes, their names toward themselves so they don't see through while you all can see. They pick up the questions, looking away from the box, and they answer it themselves. Whatever they choose, they have to answer. The first question for Dr. William Campbell. And the next question for Dr. Zakir. They can pick up the questions in advance so that we don't waste time in the reading the questions. So one, one question, they can start. And we'll allow Dr. William to read for some time if he wants. There's the first question. I will read the question. But first, I just want to say about everything made of water. It's perfectly obvious. Every time you smash a bug, 
It's made of water. Every living thing is made of water, but it's observable. It's not a miracle. Okay, Dr. Campbell. If you cannot answer the contradictions in Genesis regarding the creation, don't you think that the, that proves that the Bible is unscientific and therefore not from God? I admit that I have some problems with this, but I also have all the fulfilled prophecies, and that's very important to me. And, Jesus, and it says that Jesus is the first cornerstone and built on it, he's built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And so the, the prophets prophesied and the apostles wrote down when God fulfilled the prophecy. I know that doesn't answer your question, but it, my faith is in Christ for as my savior. Okay, thank you, Dr. Naik. Text and translation are two different words, giving two different meanings in the Bible, in English, a text or a translation. Can scientifically text and translation be proved to be the one and the same? Did God reveal his messages upon Moses and Jesus, peace be upon, upon them in English? That's a very good question. Can the text and translation be the same? No. A text and translation cannot be exactly the same, can come close to it. And according to Maulana Abdul Majid Daryabadi, he said, the most difficult book in the world to translate is the glorious Quran. Because the language of the Quran is so eloquent, it is so superior, so noble. And one word in Arabic has got several meanings. Therefore, to translate the Quran is the most difficult. It is not the same. And if there's a mistake in the translation, it is a human handiwork. The human being who's translating, he's to blame, not Almighty God. Regarding, was Bible revealed in English? No. Bible was in, revealed in English. It's Old Testament in Hebrew, New Testament in Greek. Though Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, spoke Hebrew. But the original manuscript that you have, it's in Greek. The Old Testament, the original Hebrew is not available. Do you know that? The Hebrew translation of the Old Testament is from the Greek. So even the original Old Testament, which is in Hebrew, is not present in Hebrew. So you have a double problem. No wonder you have scribal errors, etc. But the Quran, Alhamdulillah, the original Arabic is maintained. It has been, Alhamdulillah, scientifically you can prove it is the same. And regarding, were revelations revealed to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and to Moses, peace be upon him, I said in my earlier answers as well as my talk, that we believe, the Quran says, in Surah Raj, chapter 13, verse 38, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down several revelations. By name, only four are mentioned. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, and the Quran. The Torah is the Wahi which was given to Moses, peace be upon him. The Zabur is the revelation, the Wahi, which was given to David, peace be upon him. Injil is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to Jesus, peace be upon him. And Quran is the last and final revelation which was given to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Dr. Naik, thank you so much. But the present Bible is not the Injil which we believe in, which was revealed to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Dr. Campbell? May we have one more? But the present Injil is the one there's always been. We have, we have texts. 75% of the text from 180 AD, that's 100 years after John wrote. He was, he was alive and wrote. You have people alive at that point who knew, who their, their, their grandparents believed through John. There's good evidence and good text. The Bible is valid history. Now the question, with the probability you presented, it is a great calculation, thank you. But in the matter of, of, of God, it is completely inferior. God is all powerful and can choose who he likes, of course, no matter rich or poor or any other thing. So how then does your probability fit in? Jesus was poor, he was chosen, he said, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I'm not sure about this. I don't see how the calculation is talking about that. Calculation was how many people could fill, fulfill all those prophecies. I hope that that's been helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Naik. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Thank you. To an effort to prove, in an effort to prove, 
the Quran is so heavily agreeable to modern science, what happens if modern science is wrong? Does the Quran always change to reflect the changes in science? That's a very good question. It's a very important question, and we Muslims should be very careful while bringing a compatibility between the Quran and modern science. Therefore, I said in the beginning of my talk, I will only be speaking about those scientific facts which have been established. And a scientific fact which has been established, for example, the Earth is spherical. It can never go wrong. Established science can never take U-turns. But unestablished science, like hypotheses and theories, can take U-turns. I know Muslim scholars who have tried to prove Darwin's theory from the Quran. Nonsense. So therefore, we should not go overboard and try and prove everything of modern science. We have to be careful to check up whether it's established or unestablished. If it's established, Alhamdulillah, with scientific proof, the Quran will never go against it. If it's a hypothesis, it may be right, it may be wrong. Like Big Bang Theory. It was a hypothesis early. Earlier it was a hypothesis. Today, after solid proof about the celestial matter, according to Stephen Hawking, etc., it's a fact. So Big Bang Theory, today is a fact. Yesterday it was a hypothesis. Once it becomes a fact, I use it. You know, there are hypotheses saying that human beings have been created from a single pair of genes, Adam and Eve. I don't use it, because science has established. It goes along with the Quran. It goes along with the Quran that we have been evolved from one pair, Adam and Eve, peace be upon them. But I don't use it because that is not an established fact. So therefore, while bringing a correlation between Quran and science, etc., see to it that you use only those scientific facts which have been established and not hypothesis, because Quran is far superior to modern science. I'm not trying to prove the Quran to be the word of God with the help of science. No, not at all. What I'm trying to do, for us Muslims, Quran is the ultimate criteria. For the atheist and for the non-Muslims, maybe, science may be the ultimate criteria. What I'm doing, I'm using the criteria, the yardstick of the atheist, and comparing with the yardstick of the Muslim, the Quran. I'm not trying to prove the Quran to be the word of God with the help of science. What I'm trying to do, when I'm being a compatibility, and I show the superiority of Quran, that what your science has told us yesterday, Quran has told us 1400 years ago, I'm trying to prove that our yashtik, the Muslim yashtik, the Quran, is far superior to your yashtik, the science. Therefore, you should believe in Quran, which is far superior. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. This is Dr. Campbell. This is the last, excuse me. The last two questions for the speaker, we'd ask the audience to just bear for us for a few more. minutes more. We have the last question on the slip for Dr. Campbell followed by one last question for Dr. Zakir, and we'll ask you to please wait till the end. It's the same question as the last one, really. Dr. Campbell agreed to Dr. Nike that the errors he showed are not wrong and that he can't answer them. So does this mean that Dr. Campbell agrees that the Bible has errors? So it's not the word of God. There are things in the Bible that I can't explain, that I don't have an answer for now. And I'm willing to wait until I see whether an answer comes. There's many places where archaeological things have proved that the Bible is true, talking about towns and who was king and things like that. And I think there's great proof that the Bible is valid in good history. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Just one minute. Okay. Sure. The question is, are there any more mathematical contradictions in the Bible? What is Bible or Islam? Sorry. Are there any more mathematical contradictions in Islam? Are there any more? Is it Bible or Islam? I don't know. I'll answer both. Because is there any more? It should be Bible, because I spoke about contradiction. Anyway, regarding Islam, the Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 82, Afala tadaburun al-Quran, wa laqana min indi gaira, la wujudu fi iktalafan kathira. Do they not consider the Quran with K? Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been many contradictions. There is not a single. Regarding more contradictions in the Bible, five minutes will be insufficient. Even if they give me five days, it's difficult. Anyway, I'll just mention a few. It's mentioned in the second Kings, chapter number eight, 
verse number 26, it says that Ahaziah, that Ahaziah, he was 22 years old when he began to reign. Second Chronicles, chapter number 22, verse number 2 says that he was 42 years old when he began to reign. Was he 22 years old or was he 42 years old? Mathematical contradiction. Furthermore, in Second Chronicles, chapter number 21, verse number 20, it says that Joram, the father of Ahaziah, he reigned at the age of 32 and he reigned for eight years and he died at the age of 40. Immediately, Ahaziah became the next ruler at the age of 42. Father died at the age of 40. Immediately, son takes over who's at the age of 42. How can a son be two years older than the father? <laughs> Believe me, even, even in Hollywood film, you will not be able to produce it. In Hollywood film, you can produce a unicorn, which I mentioned in my talk. Unicorn, you can have cockroaches, which the Bible speaks about. Cockroaches and, and dragons and serpents. But in Hollywood, you cannot even show a son being two years older than the father. It cannot even be a miracle. Even in miracle, it's not possible. Impossible. In miracle, you can have a person being born of a virgin birth, but in miracle, you can't have a son being older than the father by two years. Further, if we read, it's mentioned in the Bible in 2 Samuel chapter number 24, verse number 9, that the people that were involved in the battlefield, it gives a list of these people in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse number 9, and it says that people that took part, 800,000 of the men of Israel took part, and 500,000 of the men of Judah. Same, if you see other places, 1 Chronicle chapter 21, verse number 5, it says that 1,100,000 people took part in the battlefield from the men of Israel, and 10,460 men took part of Judah. Was it 800,000 people who took part from the men of Israel, or was it 1,100,000? Was it 5 lakh people of Judah that took part or 10,460? A clear-cut contradiction. Furthermore, it's mentioned in the Bible in 2 Samuel chapter number 6, verse number 23, that Michelle, the daughter of Saul, she had no sons. 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse number 8, Michelle, the daughter of Saul, had five sons. One place it says no children, no son, no daughter, other place, five sons. Furthermore, if you read, it's mentioned in Gospel of Matthew, chapter number one, verse number 16, it says about the genealogy of J.S. Christ, peace be upon him, as well as Luke, chapter number three, verse number 23, and it says that Jesus' father, that Joseph, his father was Jacob, in Matthew, chapter one, verse 16. And Luke chapter 3, verse number 23, Jesus' father Joseph, his father was Haley. Did Jesus' father Joseph had two fathers? What do you call a person who has got two fathers? Or was it Haley or was it Jacob? Thank you, Clear Dr. Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, can, we, can we have you bear with us for two minutes? We have the renowned international Islamic scholar amongst us, Dr. Jamal Badawi. And on behalf of the Islamic Research Foundation, we feel it an honor if he would take the pleasure of inaugurating or releasing the book just written by Dr. Zakir Naik, The Quran and Modern Science, Compatible or Incompatible. Dr. Jamal Badawi to uh, release the book, which has just recently been published and printed a few days back, and being released here in Chicago on this appropriate occasion. And I think there is no uh, more fitting way as a gesture of friendship than to ask Dr. Zakir to give it to Dr. Campbell by himself. <laughs> As we have a very limited number of these copies available, so we request only the non-Muslim guests who have come here 
to kindly take a complimentary copy of the book as they leave the auditorium if they are interested. It would be a pleasure. May I call upon Dr. Sabil Ahmed to present the vote of thanks. Again, on behalf of Islamic Circle of North America, I would really thank all of you for your patience and all our distinguished guests over here for giving us a very good performance for all of us. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik wa shadu wa la ilaha illa anta wa nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilahi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Thank you.